a joke for you. All right, let's move on. All right, so, so the question is, should I learn about demonization and spiritual warfare? Absolutely. Should I learn how to drive out demons? Yes. But I don't do it unless the Lord shows me that's what it is. See, I learn these things, and then I learn to be led by the Lord. That's the correct principle here. Okay? So uh, we find out there are demonizations. And, <clears throat> boy, um, I, traveling in the world and even the United States, you'd be amazed on how much you run into things you don't even have a theological grid for. So I put it on the notes. You're going to run into people that are practicing witchcraft, casting spells, and doing these things called a magic lock on people. And you're going, what the heck is that? But it doesn't matter. I'll explain it to you maybe tomorrow. It's a Hebrew term that the word magic is tied in in the Hebrew language. It's not the word magic. It's the word thing called magic knot or lock. So it's trying to get a demon to wrap themselves up and bind a person, and only a Christian can come and break the power of it. All right? Now you're saying, was well, this still possible? Well, in the United States, we have a view. It's funny. We have a view of um, occultism or witchcraft that's either Disneyland, which means it's cute and adorable, or it's just some kind of folklore, goofy thing, and it has no spiritual basis behind it. I think, I think both are extreme. I think the reality of it is, is this. Demons want to do things, and they get people to agree with them to cause problems in people's lives. Uh, I've run into this. I've gone to different countries and seen people with physical conditions, and the Lord's telling me, that's witchcraft. And remember, when I started off, I didn't believe any of that was possible. And when he told it to me, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. And then God would take them through some form of prayer, and they'd get healed. And then I'm trying to theologically try to figure out what in the world just happened. It's literally going on out there. But again, I don't go after it. I let the Lord point it out to me. This is what you're dealing with. All right. Number three, prayer section three. Now, this is where I want to go with you guys because we're getting in down into the basics. When we pray for people, and at this point, I, I really want to encourage you guys, think about this. I'm not just wanting to pray for people anymore. I'm literally wanting to learn how to pray for people so there's an effect. Does that make sense? I don't want to just pray, well, you know, God, I don't know what you want to do here. I hope you help them. Um, what I want to say is let's, let's actually figure out how God can actually come towards a person and literally minister to him, and we expect God to heal him right there when we pray for him. That's what I think we should aspire to. This is where God wants us to go, is to believe that he can actually change the situation when I pray for it. This is very interesting. In my own journey with God, God's always challenging me on concepts of him showing up in a situation. Do you guys remember in the Bible where Jesus came to a bunch of people and he said, now like when two or three of you gather in my name, I'm there with you? Remember that passage when Jesus was talking about that? What's fascinating is, you know how it's been taught incorrectly in the body of Christ? Kelly and I say, hey, we're here in Jesus' name. Now, do you want a Mercedes? I want a BMW. Now, let's tell Jesus that's what we want. We come into agreement, right? You ever see people do that kind of stuff? Let's, let's get in agreement over this thing. Now, you guys ready? The fascinating thing about the passage is the passage isn't trying to say, how can Kelly and I figure out how to get Jesus to give us something he doesn't want to give us? The passage is talking about, it described, he will be there with you. Now, we have the theology in Christianity that God is everywhere at all times. So why does he make these distinctions by saying, I'll be there with you? He's trying to show something about the kingdom that's incredibly powerful. When you and I gather in his name, he's not just there and we don't recognize him. He's trying to give a distinction when he says, I'm there with you. He means his manifest presence is there with you to do the things that you're, he's going to show you to come into agreement with so they can be accomplished on this planet. It's a, it's a statement of the manifest presence of God. And what that made me do is it made me think, what, if God says he manifests his presence when we gather in his name, why do I pray about like I want him to show up two weeks later instead of pray, uh, praying like he's here right now wanting to do something about it? The suddenness of God's manifest presence is with you every time you gather in his name. Now, I've seen him work this out everywhere I, uh, on my adventures. I go into houses with other Christians. They want prayer for healing, when I get there, I recognize, wait a minute, he gathered us here in his name, so he's here, and so it already means he wants to do something. I just need to figure out how to cooperate with what he's doing so that it can be accomplished. All right, so here's the, what we call, there are two types of prayers that you and I have to learn from the Bible. The first one we do the minute we meet the Lord Jesus Christ, it's called petition. 
Okay? It's the natural thing. God, please help us in this situation. Please minister to this person. And does God heal people that way? Well, yes, we've, we'd probably all have, many of us have many testimonies where we say, well, I asked God to do this, and he came and he did that. That's one form of prayer, and if you pray that way and a person doesn't get healed, here's the thing that uh, we want to grow into. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to heal them. It means we're choosing the wrong prayer in that situation. 